yeah so it says we are live now good evening everybody and i'm ishan welcome to carwan today we are here with another great lecture by another great historian dr kathryn scofield who is a historian of hindustani music and mughal india in telling stories about musical life she writes on sovereignty and selfhood affection and desire sympathy and loss and power worldly and strange her latest book music and musicians in late mughal india histories of the ephemeral 1748 to 1858 will be out with cambridge university press in 2022 today she is going to talk about archives differing trinophonic stereophonic methods auditory history and the para colonial indian ocean 1760 to 1860 so without further ado i formally invite and welcome dr scofield and thank you so much ma'am for accepting our invitation for delivering today's carwan lecture it was earlier planned in I, it was earlier planned in april but for due to some unavoidable un circumstances we have to cancel that but today we have her with us to deliver this lecture so over to you ma'am and thank you so much thank you so much for such a lovely introduction and i've got some slides here which i want to share with uh, with you all um but before i start um uh hello to everyone um and um my heart goes out to all of you who are suffering um and who whose relatives have been suffering from this terrible uh virus um that that we're enduring um hopefully this next uh 40 minutes or so will um help to um to put that to one side for a while so um i i aim to do two things um the first is to suggest that if we're truly going to move towards genuinely global histories of music we need to do so first from firm footholds in locality and region before we can then move beyond them to find points of connection and legitimate comparison across the world's continents and oceans the second is to suggest we then need to develop stereophonic ways of listening to regional archives so we might discern the harmonies and counterpoints of the broader networks and connections that undoubtedly link them changing over time remembering as barry flood reminds us that the world has for millennia been multiply interconnected that people and things have always traveled far and encountered and enriched and devastated each other So as a small case study I'm going to share with you some of the methods that we developed recently in our study of musical transitions in the Indian Ocean 1750 to 1900 that might enable such cross regional dialogue to take place. So in 2011 to 16 it's 5 years ago now I ran a large European Research Council project which examined the ways in which vernacular fields of music and dance in the eastern Indian Ocean changed. during their decisive transitions to and through colonial rule between about 1750 and 1900 our work centered on north india the malay world and migrations between them across the bay of bengal and between us we excavated vast unstudied regional language archives for the musical and auditory histories of north india and the malay world in three major pan regional languages at least 10 local vernaculars and the languages of colonial rule mainly english and dutch where possible we also made use of visual records and material objects including paintings early photographs diagrams notations musical instruments and maps Multilingual and interdisciplinary examination of these heterogeneous sources has led to genuinely new understandings of how colonial regimes of power and systems of knowledge interacted musically with their local counterparts in the long transitional period before and slightly overlapping the era of the sound recording which is begins in about 1898. Most historical studies of music in colonial South and Southeast Asia have either treated the colonial regime as an epiphenomenon or focused on the later period from 1870 onwards. But we started from Sheldon Pollock's premise that er histories of earlier periods are urgently necessary. After all, by 1870 both the British and the Dutch had been entrenched in the Indian Ocean for nearly 300 years. <laughs> 
Colonial studies, Pollock writes, has often been skating on the thinnest ice, given how much it depends on a knowledge of the pre-colonial realities that colonialism encountered and how little such knowledge we actually possess. We cannot know how colonialism changed South and Southeast Asia if we do not know what was there to be changed. It's impossible to assess colonialism's true impact upon music in India and the Malay world, to unravel the complex processes by which Asian and European systems of musical knowledge interacted and were transformed, unless we first excavate their pre-colonial histories from their own archives and unpick the multiple transitions of these fields towards and alongside early colonial rule. It's obvious from the treasure trove we've uncovered that writing such histories is eminently possible for South and Southeast Asia. We established that for this earlier period, there are enormous archives throughout India and the Malay world which allow music and auditory histories to be written. These archives are in many languages, extremely diverse and represent multiple lineages of knowledge. And there's a particularly challenging disparity between the archives in Indian versus Malay world languages. We therefore had to develop a number of approaches and techniques to make sense of sonic traces within individual archives, as well as trans-archival connections. Our methodological principles are fourfold. The first is a broadening of the field of analysis from music and dance to sound, listening and embodiment, and thus to auditory history with its focus on human responses to sound. The absence of music specific literature in the Malay archive led us to pay close attention to the ways in which pre 20th century Asian literatures and languages are themselves both deeply sonorous, often designed to be sounded aloud, and alive with information about humanly significant sound worlds. A transfer of historical attention to sound and listening facilitates the segmentation of the concept music into constituent parts, sound, embodied experience, emotional response, aesthetic and ethical discourse, moral and political action. This turn opens literary, visual and material archives to music history because in the inscribed testimony of historical listeners, we have access to all of these components, if rarely all in the same object. The second principle, is multilingualism. The individuals we're writing about existed in a world where operating in multiple languages was normative. So we need to place archives in different languages from the same times and regions back into dialogue. The response of local knowledge systems to the spread of colonial epistemologies can only be understood through meticulous excavation of regional language materials synchronically with the colonial language counterparts over time. The same approach is required to make sense of key temporal shifts in knowledge production from one regional language to another, or of the translation of Asian sounds, performers, or materia musica across large geographical spaces. Our third principle, intermediality, is related. Close attention to the ways in which visual, literary, and sonic representations have historically enriched each other. Our work has shown that intellectuals and practitioners in both India and the Malay world cultivated a rich and virtuosic aesthetic of borrowing and reuse across languages, media and cultural boundaries. This predated colonialism and persisted throughout it. An intermedial approach is a corrective to the disciplinary entrenchment of literary art and music scholarship that has placed this crucial regional aesthetic beyond view. And finally, our fourth principle is stereophony, listening for connections and comparisons across the ocean between India and the Malay world. This emphatically does not imply a return to the discredited hierarchies and diffusionist agenda of old school comparative musicology. Rather, it requires recognition of the fact 
that communities of the Indian Ocean have been politically, economically, socially, and culturally entangled for well over a millennium, as the burgeoning field of Indian Ocean Studies has amply demonstrated. Europeans were Johnny's come lately. While competing European art empires artificially carved up the Eastern Indian Ocean between them, extensive circulation not merely continued under colonial noses, but was expedited and enhanced by colonial infrastructures. Listening stereophonically to what was going on on both sides of the Bay of Bengal and paying attention to circulation and significant geographies in the region has been fundamental in exposing just how diverse the experience of colonialism was for different musical people across the region. For this is what we have found. What do we learn when we focus the much debated history of colonial transition and the extent of colonialism's transformation of local knowledge systems on the ephemeral phenomena of sound, listening, and embodied experience. Our virtuosically multiple archive shows us that in different ways, times, and locales, colonialism was much more variegated in its effects on music in South and Southeast Asia than models of top-down hegemony allow. Colonial power did have enormous distorting effects, but not necessarily in ways we have come to expect. Colonial discourse on music was largely irrelevant to most local systems of knowledge and practice until well past the middle of the 19th century. Of far greater impact were European notions of the proper uses of space, time, and resources, ways of doing business, employment of musical labor, interference in older economic modes, civic regulations and jurisprudence, technology, and significant acts of actual, as opposed to epistemic, violence. Notably, the vicious British suppression of the 1857-8 Indian uprising and the 1824 Anglo-Dutch Treaty, which at a stroke cut the Malay world in two. Instead, what we found is that colonial discourse on music was only directly important after 1858 to a limited top slice of local opinion. Those wearyingly familiar Western educated urban middle class elites who sought to speak for the emergent nation and reform local systems along Western lines. Reformist opinions and activities may have been highly audible and visible to the colonial public sphere, but the vast bulk of the archive clarifies that they were not representative of a mainstream of local views and practices under colonialism. Rather, they were but a minor strand amongst many more prevalent lineages of regional knowledge that competed throughout the colonial era in a diverse and dynamic musical economy. These lineages were facilitated by colonial presence, but the vast majority, including both old and distinctively modern expressions, were not products of colonial or reformist epistemologies. In seeking to account for this diverse economy, while never losing sight of the colonial context in all its vileness, we have developed the concept of paracolonial knowledge systems. Taken originally from Stephanie Newell's pioneering work on West Africa and denoting both beside and beyond the colonial, the paracolonial allows us to discard the center periphery model and instead to analyze the local cultural productivity which undoubtedly took place over the generations alongside and beyond the British presence in the region as a consequence of the British presence, but not as its direct product. The notion of the paracolonial enables us to account for the many otherwise unaccountable vernacular musical practices and knowledge systems that coexisted in differing relations to European power during the years conventionally marked off as the colonial period. It also makes sense of the persistence of older forms, ideas and communities well into the era of independence, despite colonial and post-colonial rhetoric and pressures. In pursuing an approach deeply connected to questions of agency and textures of interaction, our work offers new perspectives on the history of European colonialism in the region that move beyond what Dipesh Chakrabarti has called the linear modernity narrative of European exceptionalism. So let's consider 
what a study of paracolonial lineages across diverse archives might look like in concrete musical terms. Our four methodological approaches to writing histories of humanly significant sound worlds, auditory history, multilingualism, intermediality, and stereophony may seem opaque in the abstract. So in the tradition of Gallagher and Greenblatt's practicing new historicism, I thought I would show you my workings. I'm going to walk you through three distinct examples from my own research in Persian, Urdu and English on the transformations of Indian musical knowledge as it circulated across the Eastern Indian Ocean circa 1760 to 1860. The examples are an Indian painting from 1760s Mashidabad, an illustrated Persian book, the Tashri al or Inventory of Communities written in 1825 in Mughal Delhi by famous Eurasian mercenary James Skinner, and debates in the letter pages of the English language newspapers of Singapore and Penang in the 1830s and 40s. I will be speaking chronologically and I'll move from Hindustan to the Straits. Each example is designed to expose the coexistence of different lineages of knowledge at particular points in time and in particular places. And finally, although each example will foreground one of our methodological principles, in all of them, more than one principle is in operation. Simply put, stereophony is whenever I take techniques of analysis or content from source materials on one side of the bay and apply them to archives on the other. Auditory history concerns techniques of listening for and interpreting sonic resonances in textual or visual materials. Intermediality is when more than one medium, literature, art, music, must be analyzed together to make sense of something. And finally, multilingualism is when I place different lineages of knowledge, usually from different language cultures, from the same place and time side by side. And in the final example, we'll look at two competing lineages, both in English. So now to Mashida Bad. From 1526, and apologies for those of you who know all of this already, India was ruled by a Sunni Muslim dynasty generally known as the Mughals. By the late 17th century, they spoke the local vernacular, Hindavi or British Pasha, but Persian was their official language as it was indeed of British India until 1837. The Mughals ostensibly ruled until 1858 when the British ousted the last emperor for his role as figurehead of the Indian uprising of 1857. In reality, the Mughals' geopolitical power had contracted rapidly to the environs of Delhi by the 1760s, creating a power vacuum that was filled by a series of independent Mughal successor states, among them Bengal, ruled from Mashidabad, and an avaricious joint stock trading company called the English East India Company. Boo, hiss. The company got its charter from Elizabeth I in 1600, and by the 1680s had established fortified cities at Bombay, Madras, and Calcutta. In 1757, the company armies decisively defeated the Nawab Nazim of Bengal, and after winning a major battle at Baksar against the combined Mughal, Awad, and Bengal armies, in 1765, the Mughal emperor conceded to the British essentially full sovereignty over Bengal, Bihar, and Orissa, which included Murshidabad. The Mashidabad rulers had aspired to Mughal cultural values and status, patronizing Mughal style musicians, painters and so forth, while also seeking to put an individual regional stamp on their style. This painting was done in Mashidabad in the 1760s, probably for the Nawab Nazim. This places its production right on the cusp between Nawabi and East India Company rule. The British did not take over the household finances of Mashidabad until 1773. As you can see, it's a bustling and busy scene on several planes divided into exterior and interior. Plebeian space at the bottom, aristocratic space at the top, and the interior divided into male and female space. It is a birth painting, depicting the arrival of an heir to the head of the dynasty who is seated in the most prominent space in the top left quadrant, the main painting is more than just busy, it is exceptionally noisy, with several different sets of musicians and dancers, all performing different functions and incidentally all from different specialized casts. They're joined 
by a set of astrologers. The musician and astrologer combination reveals this as a classic Mughal genre painting, the birth celebration of a dynastic figure, a riff that goes back. Sorry about that. <laughs> I've got a message about this meeting being recorded. Um, so they're joined by a set of astrologers, and this is a classic Mughal genre painting. The birth celebration of the dynastic figure, a riff that goes back to the 16th century, illustrations made for the Mughal dynastic chronicle par excellence, the Akbar Nama. And here we have three examples of what I'm discussing. Techniques of listening for significant resonances and for noisiness in Mughal historical narratives and their illustrations came originally from the Malay side of the project. So we have auditory history and stereophony here. Music treatises do not figure as a genre in traditional Malay literature, but what it features in spades are historical chronicles, hikayats and epic poems, shayas, that were designed to be recited and sung aloud to appreciative audiences. These are full of onomatopoeia, chalap, chalap, splashing of water, kalantang, the clanging of a gong, gegagimpta, an uproar. But three sound qualities were specially culturally significant and imbued with supernatural power over the living world. Thunderousness, gemuru, sweet harmoniousness, merdu, and bustling celebratory liveliness, ramai. All three it turns out, are important in the Mughal domains as well. And we particularly see the last of these liveliness um, here. Moreover, Mughal literature, notably the Akbar Nama, was traceably influential in the 17th century development of Malay historical literature. And we know the Akbar Nama itself was recited, performed, perhaps even sung to the Mughal emperor because the emperor Akbar was illiterate. So let's have a quick listen to the moment of Akbar's birth from the Akbar Nama. The women of the household made ready a feast of joy and exultation. The veiled ones of the pavilion and the chaste inmates of the royal harem anointed the eye of hope with the collyrium of rejoicing and coloured the eyebrows of desire with the indigo of merriness. They decked the ear of good tidings with the earring of success, painted the face of longing with the vermilion of pleasure encircled the forearm of wish with the bracelet of purpose and donning the anklet of splendor on the dancing foot, stepped into the theater of delight and joy and raised the strain of praise and gratulation. Fan wavers sprinkled otto of roses and winnowed the air with sandal scented arms. Dark haired maidens freshened the floor by rubbing it with perfumes. Rose cheeked damsels gave a new luster to joy by sprinkling rose water. Red garmented, sweetly smiling nymphs enveloped the silver bosomed ones in gold by scattering saffron. Rose scented, jasmine cheeked ones soothed the rapid dancers with camphorated sandalwood. Gold and furibles on the borders of the carpet gave off fumes of incense. They uncovered the stoves which were filmed with lime aloes and ambergris. Musicians created enchanting ecstasy and melodious minstrels breathed forth magic strains. Notice here the buildup of sensations, the feel of calyrium, indigo, vermilion, sandal and sweat on the skin. The scent of attar, sandal, rose water, saffron, camphor, incense, aloes and ambergris. The heat of the thuribles in the stove and the sweatiness of the dance. All of them, like music, ephemeral and doomed to dissipate once the moment of celebration is over. But enlivened repeatedly here in the sonic virtuosity of the text. Almost like a cauldron bubbling over, it is at this point when the musicians begin to sing that the prose breaks into poetry to get closer to the experiential effect of music on the listeners through rhyme, alliteration and rhythm. It's as if authors felt that prose is simply insufficient to capture the sheer excess of sensation that music can provide. But why was this noisiness reproduced in text and visual image so important? from the height of Mughal power to the eve of British takeover. The clue lies in the equally ever-present astrologers. Noise and music, and specifically the North Indian classical rags, were powerful and auspicious when performed at precisely the right time as calculated in sync with the stars. From the 14th century until now, 
each of the rags of North Indian art music has existed in two forms that are supposed to evoke each other synesthetically. A five to seven note pitch set and various rules for constructing them into a melody and a set of extra musical associations with specific moods, times and seasons personified in poetry and painting as a hero, heroine or supernatural being. When performed at the right time, each rag should have a specific effect on the listener or the natural world. Rag Meg, for example, is supposed to bring on the monsoon rains. The Persian language intellectuals who created the Mughal canon of Hindustani music theory explained the connection between timing and effect using two Greco-Arabic theories, Pythagoras, music of the spheres, expanded by Plato, and humoral medicine known in India today as Unani medicine. In the Mughal court, just as the harmony of the universe was maintained by the movement of the seven celestial bodies through the 12 houses of the zodiac, so the harmony of the terrestrial sphere was maintained by the movement of the seven swaras of the Indian scale through the 12 semitonal positions me measured mathematically on the string of the Indian instrument, the Rudravina. Each note resonated with the elemental properties of its presiding star and could thereby affect the humours of all things. So if a listener were full of cold, dry melancholy, for example, then rags emphasising me, the airy seventh scale degree, should be played. Astrology and music were both technologies for channeling supernatural power to balance the body politic and thus abundant sound of the right kind at exactly the right time was necessary at all major events like the birth of an heir. This is not to say that there was no change in Mughal musical knowledge from 1660s Delhi to 1760s Murshidabad. Knowledge of the systematic astrological foundations of the Rag's powers had attenuated to a species of superstition as early as the 1740s. The melodic form of Mar Rag Meg was still believed to bring the monsoon but few knew how or why. In particular, the tantric potency of rag paintings had already dissipated during the 17th century as the genre moved from the pre-Mughal courts of Rajasthan and the Deccan to the Mughal court, where it was displaced by a different kind of power, the power of courtly taste. In other words, knowledge of how the rags affected listeners had already attenuated before European Enlightenment epistemologies appeared on the scene to work their Weberian disenchantments. That being said, the link between music, astrology and auspicious timing and the requirement for musicians and dancers and astrologers to attend all life cycle events remained well into the colonial period. One of the oddest sources I've come across is this one, a mid 18th century manual for the practical training of munchies, civil servants, pri private secretaries. It mostly covers accountancy, weights and measures, calendrical systems, etc. Why on earth would a munchi need to know Indian music theory, and in particular the precise timing and effects of the 36 rags? The fact that the Indian astrological system is chapter 3, section 1, and music section 2, suggests that astrology and music retained local currency as regulators of time and human affairs. And if we have a look closer once more at the painting, what is it they are actually doing? They are waiting or being told off for not waiting for the exact auspicious moment of a live birth before they strike up their instruments and cast their horoscopes. In the late 1780s, a disciple of the chief hereditary musicians to the Mughal emperors wrote that one of his colleagues, Chabar Khan, had gone to the court of Murshidabad sometime since, but we haven't heard anything from him or the other Kalawans in a while. Official colonial records in the National Archives of India in Delhi suggest why. In January 1773, a British official was placed in charge of slashing the Nawab Nazim's household expenditure. He sent the previous year's unstraightened accounts and a proposed budget back to his masters in Calcutta. Notice that all budgets are slightly reduced, except one, which has had a swinging cut from 1,393 rupees to 16, the budget for the musicians employed in the Department of Entertainment. It was not local absorption of colonial discourse that changed things in the case of Murshidabad's flourishing late Mughal musical scene, 
It was the pen stroke of a culturally illiterate accountant who considered court music to be unnecessary frippery rather than what it actually was, indispensable to the health and prosperity of the court. British values concerning the proper uses of time and resources and contempt for Oriental despotism were at the back of this action, but left unstated. Its political import was the same in the end, but I suspect felt much more keenly by Murshidabad than its architect probably intended. Actions like these with unplanned but often harsh consequences for local musical fields only increased as the British gained geopolitical power over India through the remainder of the 18th century. In 1803, the company finally took control of the Mughal capital, Delhi, and the protectorship of the elderly Mughal Emperor Shah Alam II. Although technically still a vassal of the Mughal sovereign, the company now ruled most of the emperor's erstwhile domains from Calcutta and made their presence felt in Delhi itself through the imposition of a British resident. This was in fact no means a death knell for local effective knowledges. The first half of the 19th century saw a floraison of late Mughal culture in Delhi, particularly in painting and the art of the book, but also of music and dance. Delhi was a long way from the balls and concerts of Calcutta society and many of the company men who served there continued an older, now frowned upon the cultivation of themselves as white Mughals. Speaking Persian and Hindustani fluently, patronizing Mughal painting, music and poetry, taking on Indian customs, becoming intimate with the local nobility and taking Indian wives and having children. One of the products of an earlier such marriage was the famous Eurasian resident of early 19th century, equally at home or not at home with residency staff and Mughal courtiers, Colonel James Skinner. It's to his inventory of the communities of Delhi, the Tashri al Akbam, that we now turn. The Tashwi al Akbam is a descriptive catalogue in Persian of castes, occupational groups, and religious mendicants of the Delhi region, with pen sketches of the typical occupations, beliefs, and customs of 104 communities, accompanied by representative paintings of a member of each one by master Delhi artists. And this beautiful portrait illustrates the entry on Kavals. Skinner dedicated this copy to the then British resident John Malcolm indicating in part an intended British audience. But the classificatory nature of the work, as well as the style of the paintings, should already alert us to the intermingling of British and Indian lineages of sociological knowledge in this text. Enumerating, classifying, and reifying the identities of the previously more fluid communities they now ruled was a classic colonial knowledge project in British India, as we all know. Coupled with a late 18th century fashion for the picturesque, this led in the late 18th century to the production of a great deal of ethnographic or character portraiture influenced initially by European depictions, but then taken over much more widely and creatively by Indian artists. The style usually involves a stereotypically dressed figure looking straight at the viewer against a simple, sometimes even white background. By the first quarter of the 19th century, Kashama tells us, portrayals of castes and occupations would have been part of most albums collected by British and European officers in India and taken back to, with them to the laity. The Tashri al Akbam has been hailed as ethnographic insofar as, although it draws some of its class classification from Sanskrit and Dharmashastra literature, much is drawn from life around Delhi. It was certainly written by a knowledgeable insider it also draws on earlier Persian language catalogues of types, which for performing arts communities date back at least as far as the Aniakbari of 1593. These classically combine knowledge from Sanskrit or Brajpasha texts on caste with contemporary commentary from life. But once you line Skinner's entry specifically on musicians up against other lineages of musical knowledge in Persian from the same time and place, his quote unquote ethnography starts to fall apart, exposing Orientalist scenes. It was this illustration for his entry on the Kalawant community that first raised my eyebrows. According to the text, which supposedly draws its information from three Sanskrit texts that in fact don't see anything on, of the kind, 
They are a Hindu caste resulting from the mixed marriage of a man from the Bhatt caste with a woman from the lower status Gardner caste. Their religious custom is to worship the goddess and to serve Brahmins and cows. However, the portrait is named and it's of a well-known Kalawant called Ustad Mian Himmat Khan. Not only do we know a lot about him personally, we also know a lot about the Delhi Kalawant community from a modern stream of Persian musical knowledge at this time, collective biographies or Tazkiras. These started being compiled on Indian art musicians from the mid 18th century, but there's actually quite a long uh, history of genealogical writing that goes back to the 16th century. Himmat Khan himself co-wrote a revolutionary, indeed explicitly modern treatise on rhythmic cycles around the same time as the Tashri al -Akhbar. It unceremoniously ditches the obsolete Sanskrit based way of measuring rhythmic cycles in favor of a new notational system that drew on current practice and West Asian models. It bears no trace of any European influence and yet it is overtly an innovation. According to the Tazkiras, the Delhi Galamwants were chief musicians to the Mughal emperors from the 16th century all the way down to the last emperor, Bahadur Shah Zafar, and had been Muslims at least that long. Himat Khan was the great nephew of the greatest 18th century musician, Sadarang, and the current emperor's chief Rudravina player. Not only was Himat Khan a Muslim, we know from several contemporary Persian and Urdu sources that he was a Naqshbandi Mujadidi Sufi and had an exceptionally close relationship with the current head of the Khaja Mir Dard order. In other words, Skinner's entry on the Kalawans is a tissue of fabrication. What I think we may be seeing is the influence of British Orientalist attempts to translate and use ancient Sanskrit texts on Dharma to write nice clean codes to regulate the wild proliferation of Indian communities they encountered in practice. A multiplicity of other contemporary lineages of knowledge in Persian and Urdu expose Skinner's entry as the invention that it is. That it is in Persian and makes use of Persian palimpsestic techniques of whole recitation and novel commentary makes it no less of an exercise in colonial reinvention. At least in part. As Jim Mallinson and Bruce Winnell have noted, Skinner's descriptions of religious mendicants are mostly original far less disciplinary in intent and exceptionally useful for reconstructing their community social histories. This is also true of his lengthy entry on courtesans in Hindustan, female singer dancers, also known as Nach girls, who were hugely popular among Indian and European patrons alike throughout the period under discussion. It was Hindustani courtesan communities who popularized the song Ghazal and its accompanying ensemble of tabla and sarangi in courts, bazaars, cantonments and religious festivals across colonial India and beyond, in this case, to the straight settlements of Penang and Singapore. So my final example of stereophony returns to how knowledge drawn from Indian archives can be used to read English records of subaltern musical practices in the Malay world. The contemporary Malay musical genre known as the ghazal has patent but rather obscure roots in the circulation of the North Indian ghazal and its performance ensemble to the Malay world in the 19th century. In thinking about writing connected histories between India and the Malay world under colonialism, Looking for traces of North Indian ghazal and Natch across the bay seemed to be an obvious choice of subject matter. The vast majority of Indian settlers in the world were Tamil indentured laborers. North Indians were much fewer, but where they played a critically important role was in the straight settlements as soldiers and sepoys and as transported convicts. From 1786, the British Straits settlements comprising Ben until 1825, Penang, Province Wellesley, Malacca, and from 1819, Singapore, were ruled from India until 1867. For most of those 80 years until 1860, the Straits settlements acted as penal stations for Indian convicts sentenced to transportation, and their labor was largely responsible for building the island cities of Penang and Singapore. The convict system in the Straits offered a great deal of license to the top classes of convict who were able to move about, work, live, and even marry within the general population. Sepoy regiments and convict populations also happened to be the obvious vehicles by which the Ghazal traveled across the British Empire. 
courtesans were regularly indentured in the Lal Bazaar or Red Market attached to military camps and individual performers became mistresses and even wives of soldiers. In addition, Sepoy regiments included band musicians recruited from the professional musician castes who back home accompanied dancing girls. We'd know too that the convicts were permitted to host Nach performances in the convict lines. Unfortunately, no archive in Persian or Urdu has so far come to light documenting the musical lives of Sepoy's convicts, Nach girls and other North Indian sojourners in the 19th century streets. What we have are scattered reports of Indian sound worlds in the English colonial newspapers, such as the Penang Gazette and Straits Times, and a vast archive of Persian and vernacular materials on courtesans and their repertoire from contemporaneous Hindustan and Bengal. Initially then, in using my knowledge of India to identify North Indian practices in the Straits between 1830 and 60, I thought this would be a stereophonic, if somewhat classic, exercise in disinterring subaltern musical practices by reading against the grain of colonial texts. But instead, I've struck upon another and rather troubling narrative that I'm still trying to get my head around concerning the sympathy of the colonizer for the culture of the colonized, its lack and its loss. Determining that North Indian courtesans accompanied by tabla, sarang and sitar players did indeed follow the troops and convicts to Penang and Singapore as early as the 1830s and participated extensively in the life of the community there was straightforward. Courtesans in North India all belonged to particular hereditary communities or castes that specialized occupationally. And we have a huge amount of information on them across all languages. Let me press you very briefly what the Tashriya Lakhwam had to say about the kinds of hereditary women who were at exactly the time Skinner was writing, being shipped across the Bay of Bengal to the Lal Bazaars of Penang and Singapore. The following hereditary communities are named Hindu and Muslim, each differentiated by their marital and kinship customs, their levels of sex work from prostitution to concubinage and their relationship to indenture and slavery. Nartaki, Abchara, Ganika, Ramjani, Bhagtan, Kanchani, Tawaif, Warisan, Kaspi, Malzadi, Beragi, Raksanda Patur, Nat, Dom, Kanjar and Rana. Courtesans also specialize in various aspects of performance, playing particular instruments, dancing, and singing particular repertoire. Literally from the womb, across the communities, the women were trained in the arts of dance, singing, and seduction, and the men as tabla and sarangi players, and managers, or as Skinner has it, pimps. Together, the men and women performed in the musical assemblies of local notables and rulers, where they satisfied the pleasures of their patrons, and I'm quoting, with the beautiful voice, the singing of rag and kosal, the gesture of hand and foot, blandishments, languishing glances, eye movements, and sexual attentions. For all this, they were rewarded with various kinds of inams, grants. Skinner knew what he was talking about, as he was an aficionado himself. Visiting Delhi with her brother, the Governor General in 1839, Emily Eden went one evening to a notch at Colonel Skinner's. He had all the best singers and dancers in Delhi, and they acted passages out of Vishnu and Brahma's lives and sang Persian songs. Mr. B, who speaks Persian as fluently as English, kept saying, well, this is really delightful. This, I think, is equal to any European singing. In fact, there is nothing like it. There is nothing like it that I ever heard before, but certainly the words as he translated them were very pretty. One little fat notch girl sang a sort of passionate song to my brother with little meaning smiles, which I think rather attracted his lordship. And I thought it might be too much for him if I forward to, to him Mr. B's translation. I am the body, you are the soul. We may be parted here, but let no one say we shall be separated hereafter. And those lines are in fact from a famous chazal by the Persian poet Amir Khosrow. And you can see here one of dozens of European illustrations of such performances, which were accompanied by tabla, sitar and sarangi. Finally, courtesans in Skinner were considered auspicious mangalamukhi and their performances associated closely with specific festival holidays in colonial North India, particularly Dussehra and Maharam, as well as life cycle events like the Mashidabad example. This constellation of practices was distinctive to Hindustani as opposed to Tamil, 
music and dance traditions. And the entire constellation is documented in the early Straits English language newspapers. In Penang and Singapore, between the 18 and 30s and 60s, professional women performers sang ghazal and other rag-based songs and danced to the accompaniment of sitar, tabla or dholak and sarangi at major religious festivals like Dussehra and Maharam and in private soirees. As early as the 1840s, these included public ticketed concerts put on by the convicts in the Singapore convict lines for local audiences of mixed ethnic background for the price of two doits per ticket, condoned by the colonial authorities. But documenting North Indian dance and ghazal performance in the early colonial straits is not what these newspaper pieces are about. We can pick that out of them if we want to, but we would miss what's really exposed, a jarring rift in colonial opinion of Indians and their cultural practices, illumined briefly by the most naked power asymmetry between colonizer and colonized conditions for Indians in the British penal colony. The most detailed information about Hindustani musical practices in the Straits in the 1830s and 40s is revealed in virulent debates in the letters pages between English speaking residents about convicts and the sepoys who guarded them. To conclude then, I'm going to read two letters addressed to each other through the public medium of the Penang Gazette in 1838. Sir, the road leading from the courthouse to the jetty presents a very formidable and warlike appearance, for on the right hand side in the open space between King and Penang streets are to be seen several tents and two artillery guns with their carriages, ammunition wagons and all their other destructive appurtenances complete. I thought the gallant Malays of Kedah might, for some unknown reason, have been represented to be coming down in overwhelming force to wrest the island from the possession of their faithless English allies. But the guns, I find, are placed in their present position to do honour to the Hindu festival now celebrating the Dussehra, I believe it is called, and I am veritably informed that from the present state of our political relations in India, it is thought prudent to secure the goodwill and allegiance of the native army by allowing them every indulgence they may require on such occasions. Thus, here is a procession of 10 or 12 heathens led by common prostitutes hired for the occasion to dance before the puja parading through the town and public roads. And is it become necessary that the government should be made to appear to participate in and contribute to these abominable orgies? Have Christian officers no alternative but to countenance and assist in scenes so revolting to their own professed religion? Or is it incumbent that their feelings should be so far prostrated that they find themselves sometimes obliged to assist in decorating the places where these Saturnalian revels are kept up by lending to their men globe lamps, pictures, and so forth? I only hope that it may not be required of officers who bear the name of Christians to take a more active part on such occasions, or ultimately they may be perhaps expected to dance and sing before the venerated images of Shiva and Durga. Yours obediently, Shavash. This is the response. Your correspondent Shavash of Saturday does not appear to have been fully advised of all the merits of his case, or he might have set forth a more striking picture of the folly and inconsistency of Europeans and Christians lending their aid to heathen religious ceremonies, falsely so-called. He otherwise might have told you that on one night, if not oftener, during the late Hindu abomination, it was to be seen in the tents, he alludes, a Christian gentleman seated on a chair with a blazing Trinchinopoly hooker in his mouth, decorated with garlands of flowers and participating in the honours of the feast in being danced to, alternatively with the puja itself by the ladies. The marked preference, however, of these dark charmers to the living object of the Terpsichorean devotion manifested that he enjoyed by far the greatest share of their attention and led some of the spectators to suppose that he was indeed one of the idols of the feast. But an occasional chuckle of satisfaction, accompanied by a hearty clap of the hands and an approving and encouraging exclamation of acha, acha, dissolved the illusion and proved him to be, alas, only one of those weak, inconsiderate mortals who from mere thoughtful thoughtlessness of the construction which must be put upon their conduct thus often compel us to blush for our country our abused christian privileges and our religion and who by thus obstructing oppose our savior's cause yours obediently wah wah these letters and others like them reveal a great deal 
Firstly, they show over a 30 year period an inexorable changing of the guard of British opinion about Indian culture from the old India hand, Wahwa, who not only understood something of the importance of Indian cultural festiv festivities, but actually enjoyed them to those who held a much less tolerant view of heathens and their noise. Here, in the space of two consecutive editions of a Straits newspaper, we have the sympathetic opinions of a European military captain patronizing the Nautian grand white Mughal style, seemingly out of personal affinity, as well as his duty as head of an Indian regiment celebrating Dussehra, counterpoised against a very different English voice opposed to all Indian noise as heathenish, a voice that was to get much louder after 1857. But we also have unmistakable sonic evidence of widespread British knowledge of the dialogical etiquette required of listeners in the North Indian Mephil. Wah wah, shabash, and acha, acha are all exclamation listeners to the most elite musical forms still make today to applaud particularly fine musical renderings. These letters were written nearly 200 years ago. And what's remarkable is that the sonic and auditory sociality they allude to here in ironic and satirical fashion, recognizably survive to the present day. This, in a nutshell, demonstrates the concept of the paracolonial. Throughout this talk, I've described a multiple interweaving lineages of knowledge about Hindustani music over a period of a century. The crescendos and decrescendos, the muffling and amplification, the death and birth of these lines during the time conventionally marked off as the colonial period were markedly affected by colonial rule but not all of them and not always, nor was there a unitary colonial voice. It too had lineages that waxed and waned and split from and competed with each other. The most sympathetic voices were submerged and drowned after the appalling British vengeance following the Indian uprising of 1857 knocked any British sympathy for courtly arts on the head from Bombay to Singapore. The last Straits Almanac published by the Penang Gazette before 1857 includes the dates of Muharram, Eid al-Fitr and Eid al-Azhar, Dussehra, Chinese New Year, etc. Of these, the first Straits Almanac in the aftermath, 1861, only includes Chinese New Year. The Indian and Muslim festivals are completely erased by commemoration of key dates of the uprising. And at the back, there's a day-to-day, blow-by-blow account of the events of the conflict. The cultural battle lines are literally drawn up here. These are clearly what the British are meant to commemorate and celebrate now, never again, a notch at Dussehra. It's in this post-uprising context that we should now place the now well-known colonial era reform movements of modern Indian nationalists writing polemically in English and the modern vernaculars about the need to remove Hindustani music from the hands of the courtly artists, the Gurana Ustads and the Indian rulers who'd supported them all of them now so far beyond the pale of colonial tolerance. And yet, as Janaki Buckley wrote in the conclusion to her book on the arch reformers, Bhatkanda and Palasco, the institutional reforms implemented by the two men of music were vastly successful. But when the modernizing dust had settled, Gurana Ustads were still very much around, well into the present day. Most famous musicians are trained not in schools and colleges, but within the purview of a differently modern, somewhat diminished, but by no means extinct Gurana protocol. The protocols of listening alive in 1838, Wahwa, Shabash, also still survive 200 years later, as does the repertoire and knowledge of classical musicians, some of them still descendants of the hereditary families of the 18th century. All this, our amazing archive shows us, was fully in place by about 1800. Even in late 19th century Bengal, that hotbed of reform, most musical action was happening in what Richard Williams has called the network sphere of private soirees among Bengali and Hindustani connoisseurs who thought reformers were charlatans. For many writers of Urdu music treatises in the late 19th century, the colonial state does seem to have been an epiphenomenon. Some European men and women too, maintained a dedicated affection for Hindustani music and dance throughout the era of the Raj, as Nalini Guman's work on Maud McCarthy tells us. And even today, while its connections with astrology have been forgotten and its characteristic gestures and movements are mediated through YouTube, Rag Malkonsh, when played at midnight, is still believed sometimes to raise the jinns. Thank you.
thank you so much dr kofil and the only thing that we can say after this lecture is wah wah <laughs> thank you so, and i hope we all enjoyed this uh, session and because the theme that you chose was very unique and something that needs more scholarship in india as well as abroad and uh, those of you who have questions for dr kofil they can send us on gmail that is carvanheritage@gmail.com uh, we'll share those questions to dr kofil and she can get back to you through email i think that's the best way that very you can happy to say uh so thank you so much ma'am the lecture will be available on youtube just after this lecture and hopefully more people will join us and they'll explore this new dimension of history music history history of the hindustani cinema hindustani music i'm really sorry and maybe next month or in july we can have a session that we were discussing on bollywood songs so do like our page do subscribe to carwan for more updates on our lectures the next lecture that we have is by professor ranveer chakravarti on indian ocean history of indian ocean and that is on 30th of may so don't forget to join us on facebook again for another amazing lecture thank you so much everybody who joined us live and we hope that you will have a great evening ahead thank you so much thank you for coming